Matthew chapter 23. We finished chapter 22 up and covering the first 12 verses here. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23 and verse number 1. <clears throat> Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them upon men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, they enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feast, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, but be not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all, and all ye are brethren equal. And call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we do love you. Thank you for your word. Lord, I ask for your blessing and your help upon the message today. I pray that you be glorified and honored in all that is said and done. Lord, please, we certainly need you to work. I know if you don't work, it is in vain. Lord, we do pray if there's anyone here who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, we do pray for that, that conviction and the truth of the gospel to be clear in their hearts and in their minds, that even today they would repent and place their faith in Christ. Lord, please bless and work, Lord. We love you. We pray, this in, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's keep in context of where we've been at. It's the last week before the crucifixion. He's going to be crucified on Thursday, and we'll deal with why I believe it's Thursday when we get to that, that portion of it. But it's Tuesday right now. Sunday was the triumphant entry, entry into Jerusalem with all the masses and the thousands upon thousands crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Um, that great day that he had as he came into Jerusalem. And then Monday, remember, he returned on Monday. And that's when he, for the second time in his ministry, he did it three years earlier at the exact same time frame, this Passover time. He went in and he just cleaned house. He overthrew the tables of the money changers. He stopped all the business that was taking place. Uh, he had recognized how God's house was being changed and how it was being used. So he did that on Monday, then he left. Tuesday he comes back, and in between the two days was the cursing of the fig tree. Tuesday he comes in, and he begins to teach and to preach, the Bible says, things concerning the kingdom of God. Well, he's in the middle of that sermon, and the Pharisees stop him. They stop him. They ask him a question, by what authority do you do these things? I mean, keep in mind, the, the, the population of Jerusalem this week is enormous. The temple area would be packed, even without Jesus Christ there. But the fact that Christ is there, everybody wants to see him. He's the miracle worker. They've heard of him speak and what he can do. So the masses are there. They're all, they all want to hear him. So the Pharisees, they got to discredit him. They want him dead. That's been decided 18 months earlier, and that's really getting ready to get ramped up here right now with what's getting ready to take place in our text. And so they asked him, by what authority do you do these things? Of course, Christ said, well, you tell me one. You, you tell me something, I'll answer that question. Do you believe John? Was he, of, was, was he of, of God or of men? He knew they could not answer that question. I mean, if they said of God, they'd have to recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and they're not about to do that. It was John who proclaimed in his last great message, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. But if they said of men, they knew the masses flocked to John the Baptist, and they weren't about to turn their back on them. Remember, the Pharisees had the popularity of the masses. And so Christ then goes on to three different parables that we dealt with. The two sons, the vineyard, and the, and, the, and the son of the king. And how each one of those was demonstrating Israel's rejection, rejection of the true Messiah. And from that point, at that point, the, Messiah, the, 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 the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they wanted him now. I mean, they realized what he just spoke in those parables. And so they tried to trap him with questions. And we dealt with the three questions. Remember the question of the taxes. They brought in the Herodians. And they figured any way he answers this, we have them. Of course, they were wrong with the wisdom with how Christ answered it. And he just amazed the masses. And then it, was, then it was the Sadducees' turn. They went for a standing question they had used for years. 
about, remember, they did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in angels. They, they, you know, there's a lot of, they had a lot of things they were off on. And so they, they gave them that, that crazy scenario of a woman who happens to end up marrying seven brothers because each one of her husbands died and trying to make a point that there's no way there's really life after death and how would all this work? And Christ answers that with amazing wisdom. So he goes on through these series of these questions. And of course, the last question was, which is the greatest command? They brought in their, their big gun at that time. They brought, they brought in their expert. And they, they, they had that meeting take place. What could we ask him? They were trying to get him to speak against the law of Moses. Moses was everything. By asking him the question, what is the greatest command? And, of course, once again, he answered it with amazing wisdom. And then he finished it up when we looked last week with a question of his own. And, again, all the masses are there. And they said, what think you of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said they, they weren't afraid to answer that. They knew the answer. He's the son of David. And then Christ gave them some scripture that would challenge their thinking. True, he was a son of David, but how did David then call him Lord? He was demonstrating his deity, that what they believed about the Messiah was not enough. That not only would he be a son of David, but he would also be the son of God. He would be deity. That brings us to our text Christ goes back to preaching. Now we have his last public sermon taking place, and it is scathing. It is his toughest by far. If you remember, we, when we went through the Sermon on the Mount, that's when we started the book of Matthew. That had been, what, two years ago now? I mean, we saw how scathing that was, but what he's getting ready to do right now in Matthew 23, there's been nothing like it. As a matter of fact, I believe this sermon is the foundation that leads to the mass conversions on the day of Pentecost that led to the masses hearing his words and challenging the authority and the teaching and the preaching of the Pharisees and their lifestyle that when Peter does preach being filled with the Holy Ghost oh, the foundation was set and thousands end up turning to Christ over those next several weeks <clears throat> so now we come to our text Again, these religious leaders thought they were close to God. They really believed that. The Pharisees did. Now, let me say this before we go further. There were, there were some Pharisees, of course, who were genuine. Nicodemus obviously comes to mind. Even the Apostle Paul, for that matter, comes to mind. There were some who were genuine and truly trying to figure this out. But the majority certainly were not. See, we see here in our text how religion can certainly become something that is bad. Really, that's the title I titled this as we're going through this first 12 verses, when religion goes bad. See, something, something all of a sudden, they had truth, but something went wrong. It went wrong in the truth they were presenting, and went wrong how they used truth. You see, your faith can become something that ends up pulling you from God instead of closer to God. So when does your religion, your faith, become something wrong, something hurting you and hurting others? We see in our text it becomes something dangerous when your religion becomes about you and not about God. When religion is used not for the purpose of drawing you closer to God in that genuine relationship, but for your own glory and your own selfish desires. You see, you still can do good and yet it be wrong. Why you do right is important. And so we're going to see in our text indicators of when your faith is more about you than it is about God. How you can examine your own heart. It's what it looks like when your religion becomes about you and it becomes corrupted in your life. This is also, there's also another lesson here that parallels this. That one's to make it personal. But you also see, and we certainly need this in our day, you can also see here elements of dangerous spiritual leadership. <clears throat> you see, you can take something that's designed to bring you closer to God and misuse it, and it hurts your walk with God. There's great danger with this because this is the easiest way to deceive yourself because you have a form of godliness. 
So first off, before we get into the points here, who are the Pharisees? Now, we know, we already know, I've already dealt with it throughout. We know they're one of the, one of the religious sects of the group. You had Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, you had the Herodians, you had the Essenes, you had the Zealots. They were the Nationalists. Again, the Sadducees we dealt with just a few weeks ago. They were a smaller number, elite, but they controlled the temple. They had the money. They had the influence of Pharisees. They were the conservative. They had the, the, the mind or the backing of the masses. There are only about, actually, a time of Christ, about 6,000 Pharisees, actually. Now, there are many followers and many disciples where that number would be greatly elevated, but as far as true, genuine Pharisees, there were about 6,000 during the time of Christ. And to understand how, how the Pharisees came into existence, we have to go back to the book of Nehemiah. Remember, we had the three returns out of Babylon. You have one key player. There are three key men in all that. It's Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And Ezra, we have to go back to Ezra, actually in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, and you see, ne- you see Ezra, who is a scribe. The Pharisees were born out of the scribes. When they came out of Babylon, much was lost, much, uh, uh, from language, culture. And remember, when they came out, they were free to leave. The nation was freed from the bondage of Babylon. But remember, very few returned. In three returns, multitudes stayed. So when they came back, Ezra, who we're going through Psalm 119, who I believe is the author of Psalm 119, he's going through the struggles, I believe, of of what he was going through and trying to get the people back to a place of an understanding of God's word. Ezra, I think, was an amazing man. He's referred to in Nehemiah chapter 8 as a scribe. So what would take place is, of course, he would stand up, and as he read, the people would stand as he would go through the law of God, and then he would expound upon it, which is biblical preaching, by the way. So, as time passes, you have the group scribes formed. You go about 150 years before Christ, we have the first introduction of Pharisees being, being, uh, coming into existence. The word means separated one. It was a group of sages and scribes that, that formed this group. And it was initially out of a desire to draw closer to God, to be more separated, to try and live more for God. But again, as time went on, Again, we're in this 400, that inner testament time period. You see the devil getting his foothold in and twisting and changing truth. So we had the Pharisees that were formed now, and this rebuke of Christ is coming against them. And in our text, I'm going to give you these points real quick, and then we're going to dive into this. We're going to see as we get into the first couple of verses uh, of marks of dangerous spiritual leadership or really in your own life when your religion is is becoming something hurtful and not helpful in your life. We see we're going to see, number one, that authority is the desire, not authenticity. Secondly, we see governing instead of grace. We're going to see, thirdly, it's about being monitored and not about being meek. I'll explain. I did come up with all these things, Match. I'll explain each other when we get to them. It's about being monitored and not being meek. And then we're going to see it's about being recognized and not reduction. So first off, let's go to, the first, let's go to verses 2 and 3. It says, Jesus is speaking here, um, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not after their work, for they say and do not says that they sat in Moses' seat. Now, in the synagogue, there was a special seat called Moses' seat. It stood for a place of authority. They would, they would sit while they were expounding the Word of God, while they are actually teaching. They would stand during the reading of the actual text. That's what would take place. And so by sitting in the seat of Moses, we're to understand this is giving the authority to teach. So whoever sat there in the synagogue was the chief teacher. And Please understand, in this culture, the chief teacher, you absolutely represented authority. So they assumed authority that was not given to them by God anywhere. Throughout Scripture, we see this. Men who give themselves authority, but it is not from God. The book of Jeremiah deals with it a lot. The Lord said, I have not sent these prophets. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. They cause my people to err. Uh, You know, over and over, I have not sent them. That's probably four or five times at least. Chapters 27, 28, 29 of Jeremiah. See, the Pharisees were more concerned about power than they actually were the people. They wanted the influence. They wanted the authority. 
This was not about serving God. It was about wanting power and influence, wanting authority. It wasn't about being real with God. And when you begin to use your faith because you desire some authority, your religion has gone wrong. Your religion, your faith has become more about you than it is about God. We see that too often today. People simply wanting to serve because of a measure of authority. They want that power, that influence to some degree. Again, it's very revealing in your life. So first off, again, we see in verses 2 and 3, they wanted authority, not authenticity. It was about having that structure, about having that influence. It wasn't about how they lived. It was about wanting that authority. Let's go on to the next verse here. It says this, verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Next thing we see here, number two, it's more about governing than it is about grace. In other words, there's a hardness to it. It lacks compassion. It lacks sympathy. We've never seen that independent Baptist circles, have we? <laughs> Where it's about hardness. Where it's about sternness. That's what the Pharisees got into. This was about the hardness. of The, the image here is of like loading an animal. That's the, that's the wording that's used here, like a mule. We've probably all seen that. I know when I've been overseas many times, I've seen it. We've seen an animal like a mule just packed with this heavy burden. Well, that's the imagery he's using, the thing the Pharisees are doing to the people, just packing these enormous burdens on them that there's no way that they could carry. I mean, think about this. From the time of Ezra up to this time, of course, you had the, you had the formation going in, into the first century of the Talmud. That's about 6,000 pages of commentary and extra laws and rules on the Old Testament. 6,000 pages, around 50 book sets, of, uh, books of this thing that were written down besides the Word of God. Remember, we dealt with this before, how, how the replacement that stated it was, it was more of a sin to break that than even the law of God. When we dealt with earlier, when it came to the Talmud and the Sabbath day, it has 24 full chapters devoted just to the Sabbath day. Let me read you some of the things out of there to show you the burden that was put on the people. There was just thousands of picky regulations that you could not do. You could not take a bath on the Sabbath because you might accidentally splash water on the floor, and that would be considered cleaning the floor. I clean the floor a lot, if that's true. I do that all the time. You could write one Hebrew letter, but not two. If your house caught on fire, you couldn't extinguish it on the Sabbath day. And if you were freezing, you could not ignite a fire. You could only walk about 3,000 feet. That might have been 2,000 feet. can't remember now. 3,000 or 2,000 feet, you could walk from your house, and that was it. There were forbidden foods on the list. If you threw something in the air with your right hand and you caught it in your left or vice versa, that was a work. You just sinned. A woman could not pluck a gray hair out. Men could. I have no idea if men could. It just says women. I don't know why. I'd have to do a whole lot of plucking. <laughs> I would have no hair left. No jewelry could be worn because it, it, it had the possibility of weighing more than a dried fig, which you could not carry. So that would be considered a burden. So they had all these burdens that they were placing upon the people. But the reality was, including themselves, of course, the people could not carry this burden. It wasn't possible. Remember, they were looking at the law. The, the, the truth had been changed. They were looking at the law as a means of salvation. They were putting something on the people that they could not possibly follow. When you understand the burden they carried, the heaviness of the religion, the dreariness of it, the, the lack of hope, even if you will, when they would hear the message of Christ, you could see why it would perk the ear of the multitudes of the masses. Think of the Apostle Paul, how he put it when he, when he realized all that Christ did. Romans chapter 7. Referring to the law, how he thought that was appointed unto life. But it was actually unto death. That it wasn't a means of salvation for him. It was showing him that he was condemned. He was understanding there's no way I could live up to that. So they're putting this burden on the people, and they know we can't carry this. It's not possible. 
And there's also another truth here that is evident in Christ's words, and that was the attitude of the Pharisees towards the people. It was one of hardness, not of grace, a sternness. Listen, we've seen this take place. It's absurd. Do you know that we're all sinners here? Every single one of us? We are. But it's so often that we turn our religion into this hardness, and there's no grace, there's no compassion, there's no sympathy. That's an indication that your religion has gone wrong, that you have forgotten who you are and who God is and what He's done for you. It's also an indicator of dangerous spiritual leadership when you see that take place. I remember, and I've witnessed it over the years. I've witnessed it, see it take place time and time again where I would just cringe at seeing that type of leadership. Really, it'd make me, want to, make me just want to throw up. I remember being in one service one time. It was a very formal, formal service. It was a graduation as well as a regular church service. A college graduation, a high school graduation was taking place. And one of the valedictorians that had spoken, there were two, two or three that had spoken, of high school and I think two college. Remember, the, as the service concluded, I watched as a pastor went to the person who gave the high school speech, and it ended, people just started the closing prayer taking place, and I watched just a, a reaming taking place in front of everybody. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. You could see the hardness, the sternness. And I saw that, and it just broke my heart. I mean, I was, I was furious. I could see the tears coming down in that girl's face. I looked over to Marianne. I said, he lost her. I said, I don't know what happened. I don't know what she did wrong, but whatever, he just lost her. There was a hardness about it, a sternness. It was almost as if it was a sin to actually have joy in the Christian life. Missing that the Lord desires us to serve Him with joy. It's even commanded in Deuteronomy. Verse 5, not only was it <clears throat> simply about governing, wanting that position, not about grace, but we see it was more about being monitored and not about being meek. Verse 5 says this, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They want to be noticed. That's why they do what they do. They simply want to be noticed of men. And Christ gives examples. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. He gives a couple examples right here of what's taking place. You see, their works are to be seen of men. This is not about God at all. It's not about knowing that God sees them, that God is omnipresent, that God recognizes what they do. That's not why they're doing this. They want the recognition of men. They want to be noticed. So they're using their faith and their religion simply to be noticed because there's a respect that goes with that. We're going to deal with that next. There's a recognition that goes with that. That's what they want. They just simply want to be noticed. It's a major problem we have. And as you can examine your own heart, you, you, can, you can figure out where you are. If you were to come in and do something and do some area of service and yet nobody noticed, where would your heart be? Would you be offended? They simply want to be noticed. Again, when that takes place, it is a sign your faith has gone wrong. Your faith is not about God. It is about you. And you've just made your faith dangerous to yourself. It's not about genuinely drawing closer to God. It's not genuinely about serving Him. It's about you finding something in life that you could be noticed for. And that becoming the motivation behind it. We should never serve the Lord with that in mind. He's God, the Creator Almighty. The one who became man and became sin for us. It is about Him. He gives the examples here. The Pharisees always wore their phylacteries. They, they would normally be born only during morning prayer. Now, I'll cover what those are. <clears throat> the, let's back up how the Bible describes it. Again, what he's giving here is indications of how corrupt the religion has, had become. 
So the phylacteries, you had four places, you had two in Exodus and two in Deuteronomy that commanded Israel that, about uh, um, having the commands on your hand and, and between your eyes and your forehead. Now, ancient Jews and how that was interpreted at that time, and rightly so, that de- dealt with always having the commands of God on your mind and your thoughts and in your actions. All right? There's no way you could actually place all the commands of God between your eyes and, 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 and on your hand. And that's how it was always interpreted, was that way. Um, until we get, we get around 400 B.C., right before you start to enter that intertestament time period. <clears throat> Again, about 400 B.C., you have your first record of phylacteries in Judaism. Now, here's where you've got to understand this, that Judaism did not introduce them. They took this from pagan religions, especially Egypt. They wore them all the times. The word basically means a charm to ward off. Pagan religions would use them to ward off evil spirits. Well, around 400 B.C., you have the first record of of something like that being worn in Judaism. And really, in Judaism, you can even tell how it was even served as a charm as well, because in the writings, it does deal with uh, um, warding off evil spirits. I'm not going to get, I'm going to read a description of it here. This isn't in it, but you're going to see how they would tie it. It it would always be on the left hand because that was closest to your heart, they said. It would start from the middle finger. They had this special way to wrap it. There's some, I don't know if David's here right now. He might have even seen this take place. I know he works a lot with. Uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, the synagogue here in our community. But anyhow, so they would start there, they'd come down, and they'd have different consonants of the Hebrew language throughout. Um, and all together, once you put them all together, it's spelled basically Shaddai, if you will. And that was used, that was, and when you read about what they said about that, again, they had the idea of warding off evil spirits, as if it was a magic thing. But it's certainly, it's certainly that certainly is not true. So let me read about them. Why don't you go ahead and put the image up right there? I want to show you what it is. You probably see once you see this image, you'll, you'll recognize it probably. You can see on the forehead up there and on the and on there from you can see it from the middle finger coming down as I described. It has certain so many wraps coming in um, up to the that was placed right here because it's getting close to the heart and that box there. Let me let me read the description to you so you know what we're talking about here. <clears throat> It says they made them square and covered them with black leather from clean animal, ceremonial clean animal. And then they connected uh, to them with 12 stitches each, one stitch for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Leather straps by which they could tie one on their forehead and another on their hand. Uh, they, they did the left hand because it said it was closer to the heart. Now in the box, they put four sections of the Mosaic Law. Exodus 13, Exodus uh, two sections of Exodus chapter 13, Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, 4 through 9, about loving God with all your heart, soul, and might. Deuteronomy chapter 11 as well. Um, in one of the boxes, they put all of those in one piece of parchment. In the other box, they put each one separately on different pieces of parchment. So that's what would take place. And so by the time you get to the time of Christ, it was common especially during morning prayer. Only be worn during the times of prayer, but especially morning prayer. That's when those would be worn. The men would come in, they would have those on during morning prayer. But the Pharisees, they wore them all the time. I mean, they they were going to show how pious they were. Look at us. I mean, the law is more important to us than it is to you. Look at our devotion. But it was simply to be seen of men. It wasn't because they had devotion to the things of God. They had a devotion to, to the things of God, not because of God, but to be seen of men. And then, of course, they enlarged the, the, the fringes on their garments. That's talked about in the Old Testament. Even Christ's garment would have had these fringes, but they enlarged them. They wanted to be noticed more. Look how pious we are. Look how religious we are. <clears throat> Again, many people today, you can dress right. You can have all the right standards in place, but your heart can be so far from God. None of those things draw you close to God. Do you understand that? They don't. Do I think those things should be in place? I do. But if you think that that's what makes you close to God, you misunderstand why they're in place. That's not there to draw you closer to God. That doesn't make you spiritual. It doesn't make me spiritual because I carry a King James Bible and wear a suit. That's absurd. Yet that's how we thought. Because we concentrated more on the external than we ever did things of the heart. And by the way, that's exactly where Christ is going with this message. You're going to see it. Boy, we get down around 23, 24, and so he's going to hit it hard. See, do you understand that simply dressing right, carrying right Bible, that's the easy things in the faith. 
That's not difficult. It's dealing with the heart issues where it gets hard. <clears throat> but many people today think if I dress for it, if I do this, I have everything in place. That's so not true. Those are not about drawing you closer to God. Different standards serve different purposes throughout Scripture. Usually, it's a protection to, to protect your spiritual life. To protect it from being drawn away, yes. But your relationship and your spirituality between you and God is directly, directly, and in, 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 in really in all areas, uh, tied into that walk with Him. Not, not some outward external performance. So they did things to be monitored, to be noticed. It certainly wasn't about meekness. They wanted to be noticed. And that's why they served the way they did. And then 6 through 12, it was about recognition, not about reduction. They wanted to be recognized. They did not want to humble themselves. Verse 6, more description of them. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue. And greetings in the markets to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi, but be not called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ. And all ye, I like how Christ put this right away. Let, let his disciples know. He's getting ready to leave. Don't, don't, don't forget this. He's getting, I mean, we are, we are 48, less than 48 hours away from the crucifixion right now. 48 hours away. He's going to be on a cross. And he's letting, he's letting those disciples know, all of you are brethren. You're equal. Don't get into this name calling of elevating one another. Greetings in the markers to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, be not called Rabbi. If, um, for one is your master, even Christ, for all you are brethren. And call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither, neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Amazing stuff right here. We see for the Pharisees it was about recognition, about the respect they wanted from the masses. It was not about a reduction. It was not about humbling themselves. It's not like John the Baptist who had preached after Christ came on the scene. He must increase and I must decrease. You would not have heard the Pharisees preach a message like that. Again, when religion goes bad, when your faith goes bad, you seek to be recognized for it. You want that recognition. You want attention. They desired the chief seats. When they would when they dine at more on the floor, they used cushions in almost a laying down fashion. And, and at one certain place, there was a head of that. That's where they wanted to be seated because it showed that people respected them. Or the, or the chief seats in the synagogue. Basically, in our day, that'd be the platform. We, I want to be on the platform. I want to be recognized of men. Listen, we do that in all different ways. That's why, well, I'm not going to go there. I'll bring it up. I don't think it's a sin for other churches that do this. I don't. But for instance, when we were doing the church sign, we did the church sign right after I got here. There was no way I was putting my name on that sign. It's not about me. This is the Lord's church. All we are brethren. I might be the pastor. The Lord might, might, has you know, put me in the, in the place of a pastor here uh, to, uh, to preach, to teach. But all that's of God. There's not an elevation thing here. They're just, understand, the abilities and things that we have are all given by God. He could end it in a second. They wanted to be recognized as the guest of honor. It was a look at me. It was about the praise of men. I remember when I was on debutation back in, before New Guinea back in 2002. I was at a missions conference at one of our Bible colleges and church associated with it. And so I went to one of their chapel services, and I had my family with me, and I think I was the only missionary that went. They had a chapel service going on, so I took the family. I went and I sat in the back row. I came in the door right there, about where Jamal's sitting. I sat right there at the family. And it hadn't started yet. It was packed with all the college students, and, and they had a side door over here like we did. It was more on a wall like this. And so it was time for the service to get started. And I'm sitting in the back. I'd never been in, I'd never been in this before. 
And so the door opens, and there was four men. I knew all of them, um, leadership in the church. And they walked out like this. And then just stood there in a line, holding their Bibles like I am right now. The place erupted. They're shouting, waving their Bibles, jumping up and down. I'm not kidding. I honestly wanted to throw up. I'm like, what in the world is taking place right now? How how can they watch this take place? It wasn't just praise of men taking place. It was worship. It was worship. Literally turning my stomach at what I was seeing take place. Christ deals with three names they they like to be called. Rabbi, Father, and Master. Each had different meanings, but that's, they wanted those names. There's recognition and respect with each one. They wanted Rabbi. There's three different forms of the word. each, Each basically represented your level of education. You wanted people to know your level of education. It would be equivalent today, the Rabbi, to doctor, how we would use in ministry sense. Which... When you read through this, not that it's better. I think, I think, you know, if you're in ministry, you had better study all that you can to be prepared to preach and teach the word of God. But if you're doing that for a title, your religion just became something about you. <clears throat> Rabbi means teacher or great one. Now, teacher doesn't mean much to us, but again, like I already said, in this culture... That was huge. That carried a great deal of respect. I mean, it really meant supreme one to them, that teacher. I mean, he is our teacher. He's teaching us the things of God. He knows. They wanted these titles. They desired to be looked on upon as knowledgeable, the ones with insight. That's why they studied was for that purpose. The motivation was wrong. They wanted to be called father. This does not deal with earthly fathers. You're going to see that. This is, there, there, there's not a sin here in calling your earthly dad father. It's not what it's dealing with here. The fair, it's in context of the Pharisees in which it's given. So why were they wanting to be called father? It, it was looked at as, as when they were given that title as the one who gave life. It was them giving them spiritual life. They were their father. I'm the one through this teaching, through what I know, through my knowledge. And so they wanted to be called Father. You're the one helping us. It's you. We recognize that. You're the one giving us life. None of that is true, of course. They wanted to be seen as the one to go to. And then Christ uses the word master. The word master here means leader or guide. They wanted to guide the people. They wanted to make the decisions for them. You need to come to me for these decisions. I know what you should do. That's how it was looked upon. We've never seen that in our circles, have we? (laughs) We've seen this plenty in our own churches. Where the pastor is no longer the pastor, he becomes the master. He becomes the one that knows the decisions that you need to make. Listen, I've been in churches where the pastor decided who you would marry. You went through him. I mean, major decisions, the pastor would decide that. That's absurd. I'm the pastor of the church. I'm not the master of the flock. I'm the feed the people of God, the word of God. That's what I'm to do. There certainly is a place in the Bible that that we're not going to forget about that deals with Hebrews, Thessalonians that Paul talked about when giving respect, honor unto whom honor, and that was dealing with spiritual leadership. But those verses in no way negate what Christ is talking about right here. There's a difference between seeking respect and, and simply honoring, being obedient to God and providing that respect. There's a difference there. You see a pastor who's easily offended. He's probably living for the respect of the position. So again, he's saying that the Pharisees, they were living for the titles. That recognition. 
to be respected. In PNG, we had to work a lot in trying to change that about the culture. It's a very religious, religious nation, very. There's a church in every single village. I mean, I know you've seen, some of you might have seen some of the videos that are put up by mission groups as if they're the first ones going in and, and the first time they're hearing this. That, that simply is not true at all. That's not true. Very religious. Now, they definitely mix spiritism and right in with it, but there's basically a Catholic church, what we call United Church on our island, in every village on the island. And so there, they had a... They had a uncalled for manner of respect for a missionary. And it was trying to teach them, no, that's, that's not right. We're, we're, equal, we're all brethren. That's what we are. See, what they were doing here, by Christ using these three titles, I like to be called, what he was letting them know is, notice how Christ addressed each one. There is one who is your teacher, your master, the word you use, or teacher there. And that is Christ. There is one who is to be your father in that position. That is Christ. There is one who is to be your, your master. That is Christ. As he addressed each one of those titles. See, what's taking place is, is, is the Pharisees were assuming the place of God in the people's lives. The place that Christ should hold. He is the teacher. He is the great one. He is the one who gives life. He is the one who guides our life. They were assuming the place that Christ deserved in their life. And then as he finishes here, let me go to this last point here. He demonstrates what really what true faith that will help you looks like. Verse 11 and 12. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that, humble, and he, uh, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. We see two things here that God looks for in genuine religion and in spiritual leadership. And that is a servant's attitude before God in humility. That's what he looks for. It's not about, it's not about using this for self. It's not about trying to gain knowledge for self-recognition or any other sort. My light's on up there. Thank you. We see throughout Scripture how God honors humility. It's living and recognizing that Christ is the teacher, that He is the guide, that He is the life giver. That's not any one of us. And we humbly serve Him out of our love and our desire for Him. Listen, life is all about Him. Don't let the devil come in and corrupt religion because what happens is you'll come in and all of a sudden we, we, we recognize you. You know, you do something, you teach a class, or, or there's an attendance button given. And listen, we, we got, we, I'm not saying all those things are wrong, but we certainly got to a very carnal and secular place within our churches, and, and even getting people to try and invite people to church, not because of the reality of heaven and hell and what Christ did, but because you're going to get a vacation. You're going to get a vacation, whoever brings the most visitors in. You're creating an atmosphere a culture to make the religion about the people instead of about God. The key to get people to do right is get them to love God more and allow their service to flow from that motivation, not because they're going to be recognized in church. That's not the key to it, not at all. See, everything we should do here is all, it, it is to be about the Lord. Remember when I first, first got here, some of those were here four years ago when I got back. And this had just happened just a couple of... It wasn't going on before I arrived. It just started after I arrived through a couple of services. We'd have somebody sing the special, and all of a sudden applause would take place. They'd finish the singing, and there'd be some... I'd cringe. Cringe. I'd pray each week, Lord, please just let that in. I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> I don't want to deal with that from the pulpit. I don't. And so the one Sunday, we'd gone on for several Sundays, and I was, I was praying up here, don't let it... The, the special's going on. I'm like, don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Because I, I knew I was going to deal with it. Lord, I'm going to have to deal with it if, if it is that day. I'm going to have to deal with this. And sure enough, the special happened, and everybody started clapping. I'm like, ah. Oh. As a pastor, you never want to deal with those things. You don't. So I came up, and I said, I said, listen, it's, in a worship service before God, it's never appropriate to have that applause. 
I gave the I said, if we were in a wedding right now, and in a wedding, somebody just sang the special, would you ever hear applause? You would never would. Why? Because it's about the couple getting married. It's not about the person who's singing. I said, if we're at a recital, applaud. I don't care. But when this is about God, it's not about that person who's singing. Just like at a wedding, it's not about the couple getting married. I mean, it's not about the singer. It's about the couple getting married. It's about God. We don't want to create a culture where it's about the recognition, where we turn religion into something that's harmful instead of helpful. We want our faith to be about God and seeing Christ as our teacher, as our life giver, as our guide. That's what it's all about. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Now this message certainly was.